Good afternoon. On behalf of the Patient Safety Authority, I would like to welcome you to this webinar titled Outside the Box Webinar Series, Audits, Chart Reviews, and Trigger Tools. The third in a series of five webinars developed uh, to help identify adverse events that are not being captured and how to optimize reporting. <clears throat> My name is Rick Kondravy, and I will be your moderator for this program as well as one of the presenters. We welcome any comments or questions, and all materials are provided for your educational use. Now I'd like to introduce our speakers for the webinar. Molly uh, Quisenberry and I are both patient safety liaisons uh, with the Patient Safety Authority. Also joining us um, today are our facility presenters. Um, uh, Jocelyn Long, the Director of Quality and Safety and System Peer Review Specialist at Penn Highlands Healthcare, uh, presenting with Jocelyn is Jennifer Shaw. Jennifer is the Director of Risk and Regulatory at uh, Penn Highlands Du Bois and Penn Highlands Clearfield. Uh, following Jocelyn and Jennifer is Robin Moran, the Quality and Patient Safety Manager at Punxsutawney Area Hospital. Uh, following uh, will be Val Hennessy, who is the Director of Quality and Risk Management at Sharon Regional Medical Center. And last but not least, we have uh, Faith Cullen, uh, Director of Quality and Patient Safety at UPNC St. Margaret. Our objectives for today are uh, list three alternative sources of identifying reportable patient events, uh, describe triggers that assist in the detection of adverse events that warrant review and investigation. And then third, uh, review what methods facilities utilize to recognize patient safety events other than through an internal event reporting. Uh, now, before we get started, uh, Molly and I thought it might be interesting if we um, posed a poll question. Um, do you have any process in place at your facility other than the submission of an event report to identify patient safety events. And we'd really appreciate it if you would post your responses in the chat box, which as I indicated uh, before, um, is uh, actually in the uh, lower right corner of your screen. <clears throat> so we'll wait for some of the responses to come in. It's like it's slowing down. Um, so maybe give it a uh, maybe another 20 seconds or so. Okay, voting is closed and you'll see that uh, approximately 75%, um, three quarters of the participants indicated they um, do have a process in place uh, other than a, a, the event report submission process to identify patient safety events, but a quarter of you do not. So just wanted to get a gauge on, you know, where our audience is in regard to what we, you know, are covering and what would be beneficial. So. All right, um, now uh, the OIG, the Office of Inspector General, uh, suggests that based on its fraud and abuse studies, um, traditional efforts to detect adverse events have focused on voluntary reporting and tracking of errors. Um, however, public health researchers have established that only uh, 10 to 20% of errors are reported, and of those, 90 to 95% cause no harm to patients. Uh, the OIG states hospitals need to um, uh, need a more effective way to identify events uh, that can cause harm to patients in order to quantify the degree of se and severity of harm and to select and test changes uh, to reduce harm. Uh, so what are we really talking about here? 
uh, it's very important to identify trends and to create a, a learning culture to proactively prevent future adverse uh, events. However, the OIG found in its review of 770 hospitalized Medicare patients discharges that one in four hospitalized patients experienced harm. Um, various studies have shown that harm rates ranging from a nine to 33% in, uh, in hospitals. Uh, the OIG's definition of an adverse event is harm to a patient as a result of medical care or in a healthcare setting, including failure to provide needed care. The OIG also found that 43% of adverse events uh, and temporary harm um, were preventable. So um, again, another study uh, done in 2012 by the OIG found that 14% of harm events were reported into the internal incident reporting system at facilities. That means that uh, the, uh, the, uh, that 86% were not. So um, what we're really talking about here with our webinar series, and in particular today, is casting a, a wider net uh, in order to uh, capture those types of events that may not be um, entered into the internal event reporting system within your facility. Um, I, I stole that uh, phrase, casting a, a broader net from our first webinar that we did back in January. Um, one of our coworkers, Kathy Reynolds, used it in a slide uh, in order to sort of uh, explain exactly what we're hoping to achieve with the webinar series. And I thought it was a, a very good analogy. Uh, also, the OIG, in terms of its identification of uh, events, uh, uh, talks about a couple of opportunities, such as medical record reviews and a global trigger tool. Um, the uh, global trigger tool was originally developed by the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, uh, IHI, to systematically screen records for uh, triggers, or sh as I like to call them, flags of clinical cues that may indicate patient harm. Um, so as you, uh, you're, uh, you, what you need to really ask yourself, are you using other sources beyond event reporting to validate uh, that you are not missing uh, events that need to be reported into your internal uh, event reporting process. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, the, some of the sources that we have identified, and actually this is a schematic that, as you can see from the footnote, um, was part of uh, ARC's CANDOR um, uh, toolkit for optimizing um, uh, communication and optimizing resolution of adverse events. And you see that back in January, we took a look at uh, uh, billing data as a source of uh, uh, information for uh, possible missed events, uh, specifically focusing on ICD-10 codes. In February, uh, we took a look at patient reporting systems uh, and complaints, um, grievances, et cetera, as a source of information. As I mentioned in my opening, we'll be talking about audits, chart reviews, and trigger tools today. Uh, but moving forward with the remaining two um, webinars that we have planned, um, I believe in April, uh, I think it's April 27th, uh, we have uh, an upcoming uh, web, uh, webinar series uh, on medication technology, and, and that would focus on smart pumps, uh, barcode medication administration systems, and uh, automated dispensing cabinets as potential sources of opportunity for event reporting. And then uh, we bring closure to the webinar series in May, uh, I believe it's May 18th, with a webinar on uh, media and publications and how the uh, articles published in the media or uh, studies done that are available through uh, publications can also assist in identifying opportunities for expanding uh, the reporting and identification, well, the identification and reporting of uh, adverse events. And now I would like to turn the conversation over to Molly. Thank you, Rick. Okay, so let's talk about audits. Quite simply, audits are used to check things.
Audits can be internal or external. Internal audits take in place entirely inside the healthcare facility. Internal auditors are often trained employees of the organization from a department other than the one being audited in order to guarantee an independent judgment. Internal audits can be as basic as a secret shopper doing an audit for hand hygiene compliance to as complex as an internal audit team conducting an audit of biomeds equipment calibration records. Internal audits provide positive assurance that controls are functioning as intended. Healthcare organizations use internal audits not only to continuously improve the quality of care, but also to prepare for external audits. External audits or surveys are performed by outside regulatory or accreditation agencies like the Department of Health, the Joint Commission, and AAAHC to assure the safe delivery of health care and compliance with minimum quality standards. Much like event reporting, the evolution and culture of internal audits has changed from a reactive, punitive, gotcha police approach to a proactive, system-focused, allied approach. This is a model from the Institute of Internal Auditors known as the Three Lines of Defense. If you think about the controls and risk mitigation strategies that are already in place in an organization, there are three lines of defense. First and foremost are your internal controls, your policies, your procedures, or processes. The second line comprises various functions within the organization to ensure these controls are being followed, like compliance and regulatory. The third line is the internal audit. This is the independent look to assess if things are operating as designed. The internal auditor does not own any of the processes and is not part of the management operating group. Internal audits provide management and the board of directors with a value added service where flaws in a process may be caught and corrected prior to an external audit, or perhaps more importantly, prior to an adverse event. For example, identifying an inconsistent process when conducting a timeout audit may potentially prevent a wrong site surgery. Chart reviews. Chart reviews can be performed for the purpose of an internal or external audit. Concurrent chart reviews occur while the patient is hospitalized or undergoing active treatment. These reviews are often done by clinical documentation improvement specialists to abstract key information from the medical record for the purposes of quality measurement, compliant coding, and appropriate reimbursement. Concurrent reviews generally occur within 24 to 48 hours of admission. Subsequent review can be conducted concurrently or retrospectively after discharge. These reviews may be managed by other entities such as quality and safety personnel and include chart audits for mortality, quality like hospital acquired in conditions and patient safety indicators, which we covered in the January outside the box webinar, or other targeted diagnoses or di diagnosis related groups. Possible adverse events may be identified during both a concurrent or retrospective review. For instance, when reviewing the operative record, it is documented that this was an unplanned return to the operating room. Does your facility have a process in place for the individual doing the review to complete an internal event report or notify a responsible member of the quality or safety team of a possible adverse event? If not already doing so, Consider working with your clinical documentation improvement specialists or HIM departments to develop a process. As Rick mentioned in his opening slides, the findings of the 2010 OIG report suggested that an effective way to identify events is through a review of medical records by nurses and or physicians, whereas other screening methods identified far fewer events. In this studies, nurses used an adaptive version of the 2003 IHI Global Trigger Tool to complete the review. Developed originally by a Harvard Medical Practice Study, a retrospective chart review using a two-stage process with or without the use of a trigger tool is considered the gold standard of measuring patient safety events. The trigger 
trigger tool method uses like the trigger tool method uses triggers or clues to identify possible adverse events. Global trigger tool was developed to provide an easy to use method for accurately identifying and measuring the rate of adverse events or harm over time without placing a burden on ta staff time to do so. In both the IHI and modified OIG tools, triggers are divided into six modules or groupings of triggers. The CARES, Medications, Surgical, Intensive Care, Perinatal, and Emergency Department. Every chart is evaluated for triggers in the CARES and Medication modules. The CARES module include triggers for events such as codes, falls, pressure injuries, and readmissions, while the medication module includes C. diff positive culture, vitamin K administration, and the use of reversal agents. The other modules are only evaluated if applicable. By using triggers, trained reviewers can look through the closed medical record in as little as 20 minutes. Recommended sections of the medical record to review include Discharge codes, discharge summary, MARs or medication administration records, lab results, orders, operative and anesthesia records, nursing and provider notes, history and physical, consults, and emergency room reports. If a trigger is identified in a record, the positive trigger indicates only the presence of a trigger, not necessarily an adverse event. The reviewer must investigate the details to determine whether an adverse event actually occurred. There are now a variety of trigger tools available for use from both IHI and the OIG, including tools specific to measuring adverse medication events, mental health, skilled nursing, rehab, ICU, perioperative, pediatric, and outpatient. The links for these tools and instructions for use are included in these presentation documents. This year, the Office of Inspector General will re be releasing a toolkit for identifying adverse events through medical record review. The toolkit will provide standard definitions for most event types, lists of triggers to flag patient harm, suggested guidance for reviewers, and considerations for clinical decision making. In addition to the IHI and OIG tools, facilities may also have their own version of a trigger tool they utilize to identify adverse events. I would now like to turn the presentation over to Jocelyn Long of Penn Highlands Healthcare, who will discuss their version of a trigger tool. Thanks, Molly. All right. Well, I'm just going to take a few minutes of your time to talk a little bit about the safety huddle that we do here at Penn Highlands Healthcare. So every day at the facility level and each of our facilities, we have what we call a daily safety huddle that takes place at 8.15 every morning, Monday through Friday. The quality leader at every facility facilitates this meeting and does roll call. We do ask that each department has a standard list of items that they report on, and they also include any incident report that's been filed within the last 24 hours. And we may ask further questions during their role call, during their portion of the report out to investigate anything that they may have reported out on. This is an example of what our roll call looks like and what we're asking for. And I know it's it's very small, but the first thing that we do is we always ask our pastoral care department to uh, give us a thought of the day. And it's always kind of an inspirational message that we all take in. Uh, to get our day started. And then we start each unit off with capacity level reporting out. So we always want to know what their census is and how many they can have for the day, which kind of helps us with our flow and our planning throughout the course of the day. And then of course their lines, their isolations, their vents, and any type of clinical issues they may be having with their patients, including their high fall risk. After they report their capacity and their devices, they then go into their verge reports or their incident reports, and they tell us what has been entered and if there's any issues or further concerns that we need to talk about or something that they need help with, we can help them right then and there because we have all of the departments across the facility on the call. 
Once this individual huddle is completed, we then all get on the call again at 8.30 for a system. So after each facility is completed with their on-site, we all get on the phone and talk about our facilities as a system, reporting out the same level of detail as we did at the facility level. We continue with capacity issues because we're often transferring patients amongst the system and letting, there's usually bed holds in our emergency rooms or hallway bed use that we're trying to decompress. That impacts the rest of the system as we're transferring patients uh, in and out. We also discuss safety concerns, whether there is um, any type of power outages, utility issues, equipment issues that the other facilities might be ha having that we can help with. Regulatory events, we always have a report out from regulatory to see if there's surveyors out and about or if there's any complaints that we need assistance with and follow up. And then of course, as always, we wanna celebrate. If there's good catches, they're mentioned at this level or if there are um, thank you notes or patient comments, we'll share them at this point um, just so we can thank everybody for what they do every day. This slide that I've included here is just really an overview of what kind of conversations happen at this huddle. Now, I know a lot of people will say, wow, that huddle must take a long time. But really, we have it down to a science. It's usually finished up no longer than 8.35 to 8.40. We have approximately 15 minutes for facility huddle and then about 10 minutes for system. So when your quality leader is facilitating the call, we, we know what conversations or questions that we need to ask when the, patient, when the individual units have mentioned their incidents, such as this first one, if our OB area reports that they had a stat C-section and they had to use our mass transfusion protocol, we know that we need to follow up with them afterwards, making sure, you know, was this a serious event level? Did we follow the process of the mass transfusion protocol? Is there anything that we need to do as far, as far as education or reporting through PACERS? Another instance that we see is water leaks in our facilities or in our clinics are reported. That allows not only for us to know that we need to report an infrastructure failure, but also that our infection control, who is also on the phone, is aware and can go assess the situation. Another example would be an allergic reaction to vancomycin. We would ask at that particular time, how did we treat this allergic reaction? Is the patient okay or did they require IV treatment? We always wanna make sure that our incident reports are followed up on. And if something needs further discussion, we will ask them, you know, let's have follow up tomorrow and let us know how things are going and how can we help. So that is um, kind of our safety huddle in a nutshell. And I'll tell you, it really does help um, across all areas that we have open communication, we're transparent about our incidents, and it helps the quality department report timely and accurate information. So at this point, I am going to pass this over to my dear friend, Jennifer Shaw. Thank you, Jocelyn. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Penn Highlands internal auditing for the Dubois and Clearfield campuses. So we are accredited by DMV and we chose to seek ISO certification and we did receive that certification in last year. Um, part of that certification is that we have a continued survey readiness meeting which is, encompasses our internal auditing process. So we incorporate both campuses in our internal auditing meeting. Um, the meeting is held monthly and it discusses issues from regulatory findings, serious events, complaints, incidents, and then based on that meeting, we determine what our internal audit should be. Many questions result from what Jocelyn just spoke about from the morning huddle reports as well. So when we do, why do we internal audit here at Penn Highland? So we, there's a couple reasons why. Um, we audit to determine conformance based on the ISO certification standards and other statutory and regulatory requirements. 
We want to determine our effectiveness. Um, we also want to see if our implementation of corrective actions are working. And then it's also part of our CLOPI plan. So we want to evaluate the compatibility and alignment of the QMS objectives with the quality policy. And this is just a little chart, um, a flow chart, how it kind of is initiated and what happens through the process. An audit is initiated, and that can be initiated based on a serious event, a Department of Health finding, the director may find an issue in their department, and they say, hey, can we have a team come look at this, this issue? I think it's an issue. So we prepare our audit activities. We get three to four people, maybe more, depending on how extensive the audit will be. We conduct the audit, and then during the meeting, we distribute the audit report, um, and then we conduct audit follow-up if necessary, whether that be revising policies, um, looking at the flow, if it requires a lean project, we talk about all of that at our monthly meeting. And I think I went a little into this, but usually there's a team lead for the internal audit, and we will receive a formal audit report out at our continued survey readiness meeting. And then we will also circle back and monitor the progress to make sure it's actually working. We take all of our audits to quality, the quality excellence meeting that we have, and then we also take it up through organizational excellence so that our senior leaders can have input into our audits. If we need financial backing from them for something that we found in the audits, then they're aware of that as well. And that is my presentation, and that is our presentation for Penn Highlands Healthcare. And we want to turn it now over to Robin. Thank you, Jennifer. I appreciate that. Um, and so I just want to thank everyone for the invitation to share things that I've added to my repertoire over the years uh, at Punxsutawney Area Hospital. And Punxsutawney is a 49-bed rural community hospital in West Central, Central Pennsylvania. And so I think, you know, when I put this title slide in, it was like I felt like an adventurer because I think every day sometimes we feel like we're just out there seeking for what is the truth of our facilities. Um, I think we know that the impact of capturing our staff observations and we seem to, you know, always be looking for ways to strengthen their understanding of their role. Um, I found this uh, old paper form that we used to use. We've been do using electronic reporting for about five years. And while the electronic report allows us to capture more info, it does seem to at times um, the staff ha don't remember to file the event report. So when, you know, some of those contributing factors is, as we heard earlier about that actual event reports probably aren't the strongest at times in providing us with information. So I've, you know, learned as we've tried to, to talk to staff and try to make sure we're capturing what's going on in our organization, that actually one of my greatest assets is using my electronic health record. Um, to alert us to potential situations. Uh, the record that we use is um, Meditech, and we also have a business solution that sits on top of that that gives me a lot of um, ability to pull data from our medical records and use that to generate reports. So when you look at some of those trigger tools and looking at medications that have been used, or Narcan, or D50, or vitamin K, um, being able to pull those out of the pharmacy as to when um, they've been administered to a patient, um, running reports that look at, you know, patients that are returning um, to the hospital for an encounter um, after a surgery or a, a previous encounter at the hospital. Um, and I've also learned a little bit, I'm still kind of learning all those IDC-10 codes out there, but um, seeing on our census reports diagnoses that were not present on admission um, and using that as a as a trigger 
to try and, and select those charts that may need deeper review, as well as pulling reports on specific um, procedures. So we've inserted a chest tube or you know something, other procedures that may, again, be that trigger that alerts us to an event with our patient. Um, also looking at the do uh, documentation triggers um, within, our, within our electronic health record, um, have the ability to actually receive a printed output whenever nursing documents on a certain um, documentation query. So when they document on a fall assessment um, within the medical record, I receive a report on my printer that says this um, event occurred. And so it is a trigger that then drives me into that record to um, assess that fall. Um, and the same thing with, with pressure injuries, um, having that whenever a pressure injury is, is documented. So it's, you know, seeing that the, the record that the staff are working within, that um, they're much more robust and in putting information into the record. So when I can pull out those triggers, um, it allows me then to identify those patient issues. And we see that too, like our infection control nurse gets a report if a C. diff is um, ordered or documented. I think we look to you then at that good old fashioned surveillance that we do. So one of the things that helps um, at Punxsutawney in kind of tracking and looking for um, patient events that may or could be occurring is um, the development of our status boards. So we have like our census listing um, of our patients and in the construction of those boards are able to customize um, data points that would come and actually be associated with each patient's um, admitting data. So things like culture results, um, stool characteristics. So if they identify that there's a liquid stool, then we may go and make sure, you know, do we have a patient who has C. diff? Um, catheter use and how, you know, when, when that is in place um, and then kind of tying that back to those culture results. Um, looking at the high lactic acids, um, our, you know, high PTTs, vital signs, do they have temps? So kind of having all of that um, aggregated on that kind of patient demographic and allows us then to kind of have those triggers that say, oh, we may want to look at this. And a lot of them, I mean, how our status boards work is you can actually click on that um, item and then it will take you kind of into the medical record. So it's kind of a little quicker way to complete that review. Um, looking at chart reviews and, you know, as, as was identified, you know, having those chart reviews in place, again, looking at, you know, reason for admission on um, our patient census list. I'm also involved, you know, in with quality and patient safety. So in all of those chart reviews on the quality side, when I'm looking at readmissions, you know, what is the reason for that readmission? Um, also looking at core major fallouts and maybe identifying um, that, you know, there was an adverse event that occurred while I'm evaluating those fallouts. Um, and looking at, you know, at patient grievances. So I think doing, you know, with doing both quality and patient safety, and I think that's not uncommon for some facilities, um, it's like you're always multitasking and trying to, you know, get an understanding of what our patients are experiencing. Um, and ultimately looking at that feedback from others. And I think kind of those relationships, um, we have, you know, the quality department and patient safety is kind of a one man show. So relying on other people who are doing those chart reviews, you know, looking at um, infection control and as they're doing their chart reviews, having you know, a close relationship in that and helping them to see when they identify certain things that have occurred, that they are sharing that with me. So during code reviews, I'm talking to our revenue cycle person, um, the pharmacy when they're doing their med reviews, um, also identifying when events have occurred 
So just kind of, you know, it's the, the village that we all are that work together. So, and thank you. And I would, Val, I will now turn this program over to you. Thank you, Robin. So at Sharon, where our reporting begins is at the front lines. Um, firmly believe that engaging the team members at all levels, um, everybody's eyes on everything in the hospital and in our outpatient areas. Um, one of the things that I like to do when I'm uh, rounding on staff and leaders is to do just in time informal education on what reporting requirements are in Pennsylvania and um, raising awareness on patient safety. We get our code notifications like many of you via text and email and, um, you know, I catalog those and use those for our safety huddle. Uh, we have our daily supervisor report. Sometimes I'll pick up something in there that really wasn't reported anywhere else. We have our daily safety huddles, uh, much like others do, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, our security department has uh, daily reports that they send to us on any um, codes that they go to. And they have, um, we have what's called daily pulse rounds on the units. And I'll talk about those in a minute. And, um, you know, through our Stewart University education modules, we can, we do the um, Pennsylvania patient safety authority reporting requirements to make sure that everybody understands, you know, what we're doing. And then um, it's just, I think the most important thing for me is building that relationship of trust with the leaders and the frontline staff, when you break down those barriers that get in the way of transparency and really get people to feel comfortable reporting and comfortable bringing things forward. That's um, just some of the, you know, things that we've done at Sharon. This is our daily safety huddle. It is a little bit small, um, but uh, it just goes through. We start out with um, successful stories and kudos, and then we go into COVID infection control we cover falls, probably all the typical things that other hospitals cover when they're doing a um, a safety huddle, and it's very comprehensive. We have all our all our departments on it. Um, I do ask a lot of questions during the huddle, and I do tie in any codes that have been that I've known of in the last 24 hours, any um, incident reports that have been um, reported, and it's just been a real it's been real successful during the safety huddle to just weave in um, asking questions, uh, you know, kind of like practicing with a questioning attitude and drawing people out and getting people to think, you know, okay, the MRI's down and to move from that thought process, we've got a technical issue to thinking this is a clinical issue and what is the outcome, clinical potential outcome with the patients and impact and using the, you know, using our words infrastructure failure. And so that's sort of a, a daily education as well as information gathering. And then I said the, uh, our pulse rounds. So our pulse rounds we have on each of the clinical units, a very large big screen TV, and it has all these icons on it that you see here and many other ones. And while this is, um, an opportunity to identify quality things. Um, it's mostly used for progression of care and discharge planning. Uh, the board, that's what the intent of the board was, but it does have a lot of quality and safety um, abilities with it and with the team getting together. So our healthcare team huddles, it's the physicians, the nurses, case management, um, ancillary departments will huddle about each patient. And this is a real good opportunity where sometimes uh, we will pick up on that a patient fell the prior day and we didn't know it. Uh, somebody got busy and didn't get to report it. Um, our infection preventionist would attend attends these as well and um, has the eye on the central lines and the foldings and things like that. So, you know, like, um, I wanted to say I did not put on here and Robin, thank you for bringing up the Meditech reports because we too have Meditech at Sharon. And while a lot of people don't like it, it does have some very good reports that you can pull out that we do glean um, 
patient safety information out of, as well as we do use the Vizient clinical database and run reports out of there. And sometimes we'll pick up on something that we did not pick up on real time. Um, we do concurrent auditing and abstraction. So I really, um, I really count on these unsung heroes that are listed here because they are, there's so many eyes on the charts. And while the chest pain coordinator may be looking at the chart for her chest pain program, you know, there's so many other things going on with the patient clinically. So the chest pain coordinator, the cath PCI abstractor, the stroke coordinator, bariatric coordinator, quality RN, um, the members on the team that are abstracting core measures, you know, they're looking beyond their uh, the lane that they're in for their programs and and do get a lot of issues reported that way, um, as well as our cardiology surgery navigator for our um, cardiothoracic program, our watchmans and our tabbers. Uh, patient advocate, I think somebody mentioned that before, the patient advocate work um, as, as they uh, investigate complaints and grievances, uh, inevitably there's probably a clinical opportunity there somewhere. Our security team, I mentioned earlier, they're uh, wonderful and they do bring up a lot of safety issues that we might not have known otherwise. Um, infection control, wound care, we have a robust resuscitation committee and, uh, and they are very good at reporting anything that they see. Um, so I kind of call these this whole group on this slide is what I call their, our secondary reporting team. You know, our primary reporting team, our frontline staff, our frontline physicians, our um, frontline leaders. But then you've got all these unsung heroes in the background who are doing what I call secondary reporting. Uh, very important to us. And um, I think that's all I have. Faith, I think I'm going to turn the program over to you now. Hey, thank you, Val. Um, I appreciate the handoff here. And um, coming into about what we do at UPMC St. Margaret every day, um, when I first had the conversation with Rick, I thought, you know, how how is this outside of the box when this is something that we do every day and you build a culture of safety within your hospitals? And so. I went down and I talked with my team. And so, like many of my counterparts on this call, I oversee a few areas. I have infection control and regulatory care management, um, quality, patient safety, risk, compliance, and privacy. So, you know, we we kind of put our brains together to really come up with a comprehensive way of how we find additional reporting needs beyond what um, our frontline staff put into our, our risk system. And so being um, a hospital that strives for excellence on a daily basis, um, we looked at all of the programs that we have because on our journey to zero harm, uh, we've designed many programs focusing on a lot of metrics. And within those metrics, what we find is either good catches, um, prevention of harm, or an adverse event. And so I just listed a few of them here that we do on a regular basis. Um, skin prevalence is something that we do once a month. Uh, so once a month, we go whole house, as many patients are in beds, and we look for pressure injuries so that we can identify any that have maybe been missed or not documented um, and be able to initiate care for those patients or if they've advanced since um, they've been admitted. So skin prevalence is an area that we find that we can get reporting in and we have a lot of focus on skin um, throughout many of the programs for patient safety. Uh, falls with falls and injury, um, it's amazing how many you can find when, that aren't reported. Um, and so uh, looking for those regularly within our programs. Restraint use for, for regulatory compliance for our CMS metrics, looking at all the patients that, you know, death and restraints are restraint um, being used on a daily basis. Uh, we have a very robust workplace violence committee um, that reaches out to all areas of the hospital, inpatient, ED, outpatient. Um, and getting the stories there that sometimes people bring back to that committee, or even when we're doing our risk assessment in the committee, we find areas of opportunity. Our merit committee, like many of my counterparts that I've already spoken to, which is our resuscitation committee, 
we get a lot of great feedback and conversations and root cause analysis that comes out of those meetings um, where we identify things that need to be reported. Um, we have a lot of nurses and non nurses. So our ancillary departments doing projects to improve patient care. And then um, our diabetic educators are awesome. They're always reporting all of the hypoglycemic events. And so um, when they're doing their reviews on hypoglycemia, they get those reports in and I love our diabetic educators for that purpose. Um, our quality council does projects. Um, they get involved in looking at all the areas of the hospital and then our quality patient care committee. We review um, our, on a regular basis, all of um, the projects and things like that that are happening in the hospital that can lead to adverse events. Uh, like my counterparts, we have a lot of really great reporting in our culture of safety that we've developed. So. Um, our security officers and police officers use a different reporting system. And so we realized that we were missing those reports that probably needed um, additional look at or reporting into um, the patient safety authority. So now our security officers report out on a 24 hour report and on our daily safety call, any events that occurred in the past 24 hours. Um, and so that has helped us with a lot of our infrastructure reporting. Um, infrastructure, infrastructure failure reporting um, and criminal events, which has been really helpful. We have our daily safety call, like many of the others, that focuses on a lot of the ancillary areas and um, issues that can come up with leaks or um, bed closures due to, you know, electricity issues, fire alarms, anything like that. Um, I'll get reported out there. And then we have an AM and PM DSWAT call, which focuses on our patients that are ready for discharge, pending discharge, or how we can prepare them for discharge. And we find a lot of opportunities in that call from a patient care's perspective. And then um, our administrators on duty or house supervisors are always, um, they put out every 12 hours an end of shift report. So anything that they get involved with from a phone call, anything that they actively have to do, um, active service on they put into that report and we find a lot of our um, events there that then um, our team gets reported specifically our patient safety nurse um, i can't say it enough and i really think that it's important that anybody that is in any, in any role within quality patient safety or regulatory that you do a gamba walk you go out to where the people are and the people are the staff and the patients um, and so I personally and all of the staff that I work with do active rounding. We do central line associated bacteremia rounds where we're looking at central lines. We do catheter rounds. We do OR, environment of care rounds, hand hygiene, regulatory readiness rounding, and employee validation of strategic tactics for our patient experience. And in those rounding moments, we're in the patient rooms, we're talking with patients, we're finding teaching moments for those patients, and we're also identifying those areas of risk. Um, and so by doing that, it really, I find that we do a lot of reporting. So on the days that rounding has happened, a lot of um, reporting happens, but that's a good thing. Um, and it's also the opportunity to meet with the bedside staff at that moment and say, hey, that staff member that was just in this room left this bed in really high position, that's a fall risk for this patient, do they always do this? Oh yeah, I always have to put the bed down after they've been in the room. Okay, well then, if that's not getting reported, those patients are a high risk for all. So those are the times that we can have the conversations with the bedside staff to really understand that you know tracking and trending anything that happens can really make an impact when creating a patient um, safety improvement project. Um, and then just like the others for charts and audits and programs, um, we do a lot of work here looking at our sepsis charts, our venous thromboembolism record um, charts, our orthopedic program, our stroke program, and readmission reviews. Um, these are, are really big focus for us. Um, we find a lot of uh, reporting that can come out of these, a lot of areas of opportunity that can come out of these, and we actually create a lot of quality improvement projects from them also. Um, I also have to mention that our discharge follow-up phone calls are also a great area where we find um, things that need to get reported, and particularly around medication reconciliation at discharge. Um, so the patient was intended to have certain medications and then they did not receive them, 
or we're supposed to stop medications, anything along those lines. So during those post discharge phone calls, we find a lot of opportunity around medication reconciliation. We also find out that home care may not have arrived or durable medical equipment may not have arrived and um, opportunities there to help those patients, but also in addition, get that information into our risk system. Um, I do have to thank some of my partners here that um, also talked about the relationship with your patient experience and patient relations team. I'm lucky enough to sit a few doors down from them. And I think we've worn a path in the hallway, walking back and forth to each other, um, just fielding out different call phone calls regarding complaints and grievances, and many of which then lead to um, reporting, which is I'm grateful and thankful to have that relationship with that team. And so I just want to thank everybody for allowing me to go through all of the things that we do at St. Margaret um, and many of the other hospitals within UPMC. And I am going to turn the program back over to my friend Rick. Thank you, Faith. Uh, in fact, uh, I want to thank all the presenters uh, and Molly included, but Jocelyn, Jennifer, Robin, Val, and, and of course you, Faith, uh, for your very informative presentations and all. So um, what I want to do now is um, <clears throat> move into the Q&A session uh, that we usually include at the end of our um, sessions uh, or webinars, time permitting. Um, I, I already do have at least one comment that I, I want to follow up on. <clears throat> and uh, what I want to do now, though, is uh, at least give you the information so that you can post the question in our Q&A box. So if you have a question, please type it in the Q&A box found at the bottom of your screen. Um, what you do is you click on the three dots and then you'll see the uh, Q&A option open, uh, the Q&A panel, and then direct your questions to all panelists. And we'll try to answer the questions uh, as, as we can. <clears throat> Uh, in the meantime, I, I, during the session, uh, we did have a uh, question, or not really a question, but more of a comment posted in the chat box that I thought I would just throw out to our, our team uh, or, you know, see, you know, if uh, they can confirm, you know, uh, uh, a similar process as well. But uh, Teresa R., unfortunately, there's no last name or what have you that says that our safety team rounds in all care areas on a route. Uh, on a, a routine basis, asking uh, what safety issues the frontline staff are concerned about, what keeps them up at night, and uh, what is the next safety alert that you may submit. Um, and they get a lot of great information. <clears throat> so I think in many respects, you all sort of touched upon uh, that, you know, opportunity in terms of uh, getting information uh, from various sources and all. Uh, but I know that um, years ago when I, uh, uh, actually attended um, the patient safety committees at all the facilities in my region uh, and talking to leadership and all and leadership rounds and coming up with ideas for uh, leaders. Uh, that was one of the recommendations that, you know, the patient safety authority was making in terms of the rounding process and all. And, and, and uh, we always wanted to find out like, well, what are the concerns of the uh, line staff and all? So I'm just throwing that out. I didn't know if uh, Molly and the other presenters had any uh, comments with regard to that statement. <clears throat> Maybe not. You, if you can unmute yourself. So that is another source of of information that uh, you know that you can avail yourself to. So uh, I don't see any questions in the q a box um so again if you have any questions please type them in the q a box found um on your screen um at the bottom uh, right with the three dots uh, once you do that you can open up the uh q a panel and then direct your question to all panelists uh, <clears throat> so that's important uh, otherwise uh, not everyone will see them uh, shelly do we have any questions in the q a panel no, I don't see any. Okay. So um, what I'm going to do while we're waiting for some uh, questions to come in, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, something that Molly touched upon, and that would be on her, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> uh, 
on slides 45 through 50, we actually have the six groupings of trigger tools uh, that Molly uh, described on her slide 14 in our uh, uh, slide presentation for the webinar. And it's interesting because uh, the six areas that Mo Molly mentioned are expanded upon. For example, the first one, the, the CARES trigger. Um, in listening to every all the presenters uh, talk, I mean, each one of them touched upon you know, uh, some of these key triggers, such as patient falls, pressure, ulcers, readmissions, uh, healthcare acquired infections and all under the care trigger. Uh, the next one, medications. Again, I know I specifically made note for um, Robin mentioning, you know, vitamin K administration, administration of Benadryl, Narcan, et cetera, all, uh, you know, triggers for further investigation. And I, I do want to point out that these triggers are not meant to be a indication that uh, of an adverse event. They're a trigger to sort of warrant additional investigation on the part of the facility staff uh, as to make that type of determination. Uh, surgical triggers, you have the ever popular return to surgery, um, and then um, things like x-ray, intra-op, or uh, PACU, um, uh, mechanical ventilation greater than 24 hours post-op, etc. cetera. Uh, intensive care triggers, uh, you see the four listed there, you know, onset of pneumonia, readmission to ICU, et cetera. Prenatal triggers, um, you know, the third and fourth degree lacerations, and then the last one, emergency department triggers. So we have these as supplemental slides to further expand upon the um, OIG's trigger tools that they were talking about, uh, in, uh, you know, as a way of identifying events. So. Um, uh, here we have on this particular slide um, types of trigger tools. We have trigger tools from IHI and then also the OIG. Um, in the OIG, they have trigger tools for hospitals, but also skilled nursing facilities uh, and then rehab facilities. As Molly mentioned, we're, they're hoping to have a, a, a new for 2023 a toolkit identifying events through medical record review. And then there's the whole long list there of uh, trigger tools that uh, the IHI has actually uh, addressed. So, um, Oh, went too far. So with that in mind, I'm going to check and see if we have any other uh, questions or comments in the chat box. Um, let's see here. Uh, um, how is your secondary reporters no, uh, notify of a possible adverse event? Uh, do they complete an internal event report or notified by email? And I guess that's a question uh, uh, for Val. Um, the team I called secondary reporters, um, yeah. usually they put an incident report into our incident reporting system. Um, sometimes they will, you know, come talk to myself or risk management. Uh, talk the case through, talk uh, what they're thinking about, but um, yeah, they'll put it into the incident reporting system. Hey, um, I'm actually watching the time. Actually, we were closer to the end of the session than what I anticipated, but we do have a question for Robin. Robin, uh, what method is most successful for identifying patient care events in your opinion? Um. Well, there's a lot of methods, but I think the one that I probably value the most here is that ability to trigger off of the nursing documentation of events or a query. So, as something is completed and it notifies me that that has happened. Um, we've actually experienced with that with our skin integrity and our pressure injury, um, the ability to actually see a lot more consistent reporting with that trigger and able to follow up with the staff um, and actually just recently led to a redesign of our of our actual documentation system for skin integrity because we found we weren't really focusing on prevention and so when the you know skin issue occurred that's when everybody started reacting and so it was it was a very nice circle of you know we captured the data we identified a trend and were able to respond to it so i think that those trigger reports that come to me from documentation have probably been the most meaningful. Well, thanks, Robin. 
Again, I want to thank our facility presenters, Jocelyn, Jennifer, Robin, Val, and, and Faith. And I want to thank all of you, Molly and I do, for attending the session today. So um, if you've had any issues accessing uh, the evaluation or the certificate of continuing education, please contact Shelly Mikesell at shmixell at pa.gov. And with that, I would like to conclude our session for today. Thank you, everyone.